Good morning, and uh, pleased to see so many people taking the time to uh, join us uh, in this results webinar. So um, we're pleased to be sharing with you the results for the first half of the year, which was uh, um, an interesting first half, given everything that uh, happened throughout the world. Um, but very pleased to be reporting robust revenue growth that's been driven by, you know, continued strong demand for our services and proving once again the resilient business model that Keywords enjoys. I'm not going to spend too much time on the H1 impact. That's already been well documented and shared with you um, before. What instead I'm going to do is just talk to you a little bit about the outlook. So we continue to trade in an environment where COVID um, provides uh, certain headwinds for us, certainly. But we have, um, as I said before, proven ourselves to be quite resilient. Um, the vast, vast majority of our eight and a half thousand people are working remotely from home, um, about a thousand or so working in studios on a socially distanced basis. And um, uh, while we have had some constraints on recruitment due to government support for uh, people that have been um, unfortunate enough to become unemployed during this period of time. Um, as those uh, additional supports are eased back on by governments, so we're finding um, ourselves uh, more able to access talent, particularly at that starter level for our um, customer support and our QA uh, businesses, our testing businesses. We do retain a um, very flexible approach to where and how we work going forward. And uh, so we expect to be able to deal with um, any um, further upcoming challenges from COVID-19. Pleasingly, of course, we work in the video games uh, market that has experienced some exceptionally high demand for their products. And those products um, being content is what drives the demand for our services as they our clients continually seek to provide um, more content so that their players can spend more money. Finally, point to make that um, as a board, we remain committed to resuming our dividend, uh, progressive dividend policy, and we hope to be able to resume that in 2021. And then uh, really throughout the second half, we do expect um, to see good revenue growth incremental margin increases um, and uh, certain structural drivers of um, a growing market and an increasing trend towards outsourcing remain very much intact. So talking of the growth drivers, as you know, we the, the video games market has consistently grown at about 8% CAGR over um, a number of uh, years, the graph on the right showing 2018 to 2023. However, that was produced in May 2020, so it doesn't fully capture the um, increased demand that's been seen during this year, during lockdown and so on. Um, so content demand remains strong. We're looking forward to the release of the new PlayStation and Xbox consoles, both of which have now got launch dates and got prices. So there's a lot of excitement in the market uh, surrounding that. It's going to be good news. Uh, certainly the launches are not going to be quite what the, um, uh, the manufacturers would have hoped for initially. But it's uh, it marks a refresh of a console cycle that otherwise has been um, in existence for about eight years. So it's very good news for the games industry overall over the coming three, four, five years. Streaming platforms continue to develop, um, and as we've seen, uh, there is increased gameplay, and some of that increased gameplay that's happened during um, COVID, I'm sure, is likely to stick. We've also seen continued trends towards outsourcing. I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. What I'm hoping for is um, that COVID-19 will have shown that suppliers like Keywords are particularly robust, um, plenty of points of redundancy built into a multi-site uh, infrastructure, and that we can be seen as very reliable, safe, and perhaps even the best um, uh, homes for a lot of the services that our clients currently provide to themselves internally. 
Um, and with that, uh, we've seen year on year, the supply chains are becoming a bit more structured. Um, there's a lot more integration between ourselves and our clients, uh, a lot more um, continuous uh, production methodologies, workflows, pipelines. Um, all of that is pointing to an industry that is uh, gradually maturing and uh, Keywords is very well positioned to benefit from that. The other point that we've shared previously and we feel very um, uh, markedly is that scale begets scale. So as we ourselves have become bigger, so um, our clients trust us or turn to us with bigger and bigger engagements, larger individual projects and um, multiple um, services across uh, many of our service lines. And finally, of course, as far as our M&A program is concerned, the um, fragmented nature of the supply side of the industry, so the services supply side, um, uh, being so fragmented throws up plenty of opportunities for selective consolidation, which is a process that we are very much leading um, in the video game space. So in terms of our performance for the first half, we are very pleased to have produced 13.3% revenue growth, taking us to 173.5 million euros, which you know we, we kind of pre-reported back in, in January. Obviously, we're going to be sharing with you some more, um, more details. And one of those details is the fact that organic uh, growth was actually 8%, um, and that strips out uh, the effect of, of currency and the effect of acquisitions. And John will be talking about um, some of these adjusted uh, numbers a bit later on in his piece of the presentation. Also, pleasingly, um, we continue to make progress in improving our margins. We're reporting a 19.3% increase in EBITDA to 30.8 million euros giving us an adjusted EBITDA margin of 17.8%, which compares to 16.9% uh, at the half year 2019. Now, again, we've made adjustments to the EBITDA to make sure that it is a um, representative underlying figure. And again, John will talk to that a bit later. Finally, the acquisitions we have during the period uh, made three acquisitions, um, the most recent of which we announced today, which was the acquisition of Heavy Iron. Heavy Iron is a game development studio based in uh, Los Angeles. Um, it's a business that we've known for a while, um, and so very pleased to welcome them to the team, as indeed we are um, Coconut Lizard, which was the first acquisition we made in, uh, in the, the first half of this year. And a bit more recently, Maverick Media, um, which is in the marketing services side of our business. So two game development acquisitions and one marketing services acquisition. Um, and all of this despite uh, um, you know, lockdowns and COVID-19 restrictions. So, um, and I'm sure there'll be plenty more acquisitions to come. John, over to you. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, good morning, everyone. So I'll quickly run through the key financial highlights in the first half. Um, as Andrew's mentioned, uh, revenue for the group grew by 13.3% in H1. Um, organic revenue, which as Andrew, Andrew has said, excludes the impact of acquisitions and currency movements, grew by 8%. Um, I will provide a little bit more color on what that looks like by service line, but I guess in summary, you know, despite the COVID-19 disruption, uh, we've seen growth across all of our service lines with the exception of localization and with very strong progress in game development, which grew by over 25%. Adjusted EBITDA, which excludes depreciation and amortization, uh, share option expenses and M&A costs increased by 19.3% to 30.8 million euros in the first half. Um, and also the group received 3.4 million in uh, COVID-related subsidies, these are uh, employment retention subsidies primarily in North America um, and given the non-recurring nature of this income, these have also been excluded from our adjusted profit measures, uh, including adjusted EBITDA. Um, so this res has resulted in uh, an adjusted EBITDA margin of 17.8%, representing an increase of 0.9 percentage points on the prior year. Um, so, we, we're, so it's nice to see some margin improvement, 
but it's fair to say that this has been held back uh, by the revenue shortfalls from COVID versus our original expectations, albeit this was partly offset by some cost savings that um, the business has enjoyed, if that's the right word, things like travel. Um, adjusted profit before tax increased by 17.9% uh, to 21.7 million euros, uh, with again the margin increasing there by 0.5 percentage points to 12.5%. Profit before tax on a statutory basis increased by 66%, uh, and this reflects the improvement in adjusted PBT, but also the COVID-19 subsidy income that I just mentioned and a 1.9 million non-cash impairment of some intangible assets, uh, together with an increase in the charge for share option schemes. Adjusted free cash flow was 10.9 million in the first half, marking a pretty good improvement over the prior year, and I'll provide a little bit more detail on the key pieces of the cash performance in a few more slides. So turning now to the service line performance on chart nine, um, art services, um, which uh, includes our marketing businesses, grew 7.9% organically in the first half, uh, with what, what we feel is a good revenue performance despite the disruption that we've experienced. As you may recall, our Chinese business was one of the first to be impacted by COVID-19, with the closure of five of our studios in late February. Um, and some of our marketing businesses have been held back inevitably as marketing plans have been reassessed during the market the COVID-19 period. Uh, game development, which is now our largest service line, uh, delivered strong organic growth performance, growing by 25.7% in the first half. Uh, this was supported by continued recruitment across all of our studios, and also with the addition of new studios in Leamington Spa in the UK, Singapore, and also Austin. And these also helped us to meet the strong demand that we're continuing to see for our services in this service line. Total revenue in our audio service line was up 12.7% following the impacts of the TVS Synchron acquisition in Germany last year. But organic revenue growth was flat in the half. Uh, as we previously guided, our audio business was particularly impacted by COVID-19 as a result of the studio closures, which reduced our voiceover recording capacity, particularly in April and May. Uh, on the positive side, since June, we've been able to reopen most of our studios around the world, and we've seen a good pickup in organic revenue growth in July and August. Um, functional testing uh, delivered 10.7% organic revenue growth in the first half, a pretty robust performance given all the operational constraints uh, we experienced. Um, if if uh, people will recall, our project work in this service line uh, is normally done out of secure facilities, and so we effectively had to put most of that work on hold uh, when the studios were closed towards the end of March. But in consultation with our clients, um, the business moved really quickly actually to move the majority of our teams into remote uh, working arrangements. Uh, and now most of our studios are back open, uh, but we're prioritizing the work that we do in those studios for things that are harder to achieve in a work from home model. So things like recruitment, training, and some of our work uh, on things like hardware testing, which is a bit more challenging to do in a remote model. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our, our localization service line went backwards in the first half. Um, the performance was held back by some delays that we saw in the receipt of content um, as production schedules got disrupted as a result of some of the disruption of our clients. Uh, but again, we've seen a return to growth in that service line in July and August in the second half. Localization testing delivered revenue growth of 1.9%. Um, this service line experienced very similar constraints to the functional testing business, but it's also been held back a little bit by the lack of native language resources available to us due to some of the travel restrictions that have been, been in place through the COVID period. And finally, um, moving on to our player support business, this return to growth in H1, delivering 5.5% of organic revenue growth, um, and we were pretty successful in transitioning all of that work to uh, remote working arrangements very quickly and, and we continue to operate that business on that basis at the moment. So now turning to cash flow and the cash flow performance. Um, in overall terms, adjusted free cash flow increased by 11.7 million in the first half of the year. Um, this was driven by the improvement in EBITDA of 5 million that I mentioned earlier and also a reduction in the cash outflow for MMTC 
and VGTR credits uh, with a sort of a 2.7 million benefit coming from that year over year. And this was due to the combination of the phasing of VGTR credits. We did get some receipts in the first half of this year and slightly lower levels of MNTC claims in uh, our Canada business. As a reminder, um, these, these are labor credits that are basically earned during the year as the work is produced, but are not typically collected until the following year. And that does result in a working capital outflow in H1 uh, as a result of this timing difference. Um, other working capital was pretty steady with trade receivable days in line with prior year at 46 days. Um, we did see a small reduction in capex in the first half, despite the higher revenue in the half. And this was driven by a combination of lower levels of equipment purchases during the COVID period. I think we would have expected to spend a little bit more on equipment, um, but, but with all the disruption, I think we were more focused on uh, making use of the equipment that we had. Uh, and also a reduction in some of the expansionary capex following from the investments that we made in 2019. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we also received 3.4 million of um, government retention subsidies, uh, uh, primarily in North America, and obviously we didn't have those in the prior year. Uh, and our cash tax decreased by 1.8 million to 2 million in the first half, largely due to the absence of a settlement uh, that we had in the prior year and a few other phasing differences. It's all resulted in an overall improvement in the adjusted cash conversion rate uh, to 50% from 30% in the prior year, albeit that's in the context of what is always a senior, seasonally lighter cash conversion period. And if people will recall, we delivered 80% conversion uh, in the full year last year. Spend on acquisitions amounted to 2.5 million in the half, including 1.3 million of cash spend on the Coconut Lizard acquisition in June. Um, since then, we've deployed a further 6 million euros into M&A so far in H2, following the completion of Maverick in August and on the acquisition of Heavy Iron that we announced today. Um, our successful placing in May resulted in net proceeds of just under 110 million euros. And this together with the increase in cash flow resulted in an overall increase in net cash in the period of 119 million in H1 compared to a decrease of 8.6 million in the prior year. And this resulted in a net cash position at the end of June of 101 million versus uh, a net debt position at the start of the year of 18 million. So finally, um, just a few comments on the strength of the balance sheet and liquidity. Um, first of all, you know, clearly COVID-19 has had a significant operational impact on the business in the first half of the year. But I think it's also highlighted the resilience of the keywords model. Um, you know, the business is cash generative and has continued to be cash generative throughout the COVID period. Um, we've de demonstrated a huge amount of flexibility uh, and that we can operate most of our services in a work from home model. Um, and we're very fortunate to be operating in an industry that's sh uh, shown to be pretty resilient in economic downturns. And as Andrew said, uh, we continue to see really robust demand for our services. Uh, as our customers continue to look to produce new content. So turning to the balance sheet, as I've said earlier, we, we, we exited with a very strong balance sheet uh, with liquidity of over 200 million through a combination of the 101 million of cash that I mentioned earlier and a further 100 million of available liquidity from our undrawn uh, RCF facility. Um, this capacity puts us in a really strong position to continue to execute our acquisition strategy while also supporting the business and customers through and beyond any further COVID-19 disruption that we might experience. Uh, and with that, I will hand you back to Andrew. Thank you, John. Now for my section on strategic review. So just a reminder for those people on our strategy, um, we continue to uh, drive to become the go-to provider for each and every one of the services that make up um, Keyword Studios. Uh, and at the same time, we continue to differentiate ourselves from um, anybody else in the market by providing this unique end-to-end -end global services platform. Um, and what that means is that our clients can source um, not only services that they might originally have acquired from us, but over time acquire 
um, all the way up to seven separate services. And on that one, I'll come to um, update you on the numbers and the progress we're making with our cross-selling efforts. Um, we do enjoy relationships with all the top game companies uh, around the world, um, and they are in vast part all increasing their outsourcing um, needs and doing so in an increasingly structured fashion, which again plays to um, partnering with a company of keywords, scale, expertise, and uh, professionalism. Um, the scale point that I made before is important, and we continue to build scale in all of our services whilst maintaining a very flexible um, resource uh, structure so that we can provide a service to our clients on a variable cost basis rather than their um, internal alternative, which is invariably uh, of fixed cost nature. We are a very attractive employer to um, pools of resources around the world, and we seek to we seek out those pools of talent um, in a, in our strategy of implanting ourselves in key geographies. And you will have seen that um, uh, from us as we acquire businesses in certain areas of the world, or indeed as we open new studios. Latest one of which, of course, is um, Heavy Iron in Los Angeles, which is a pool of talent that we haven't um, hitherto tapped. So um, we have built ourselves into a highly resilient business, and that resilience comes from both the business model itself, how we operate, how we uh, staff ourselves, but the diversified geography that we enjoy with a full global reach, the diversified mix of services, and the global uh, client base across all types of video games and all platform types. Each one of those points of resilience also provides a point of growth for us. Um, and as we continue to build the backbone of um, our kind of infrastructure for HR, for IT, for, for finance and so on, and uh, our business development capability, so we become a um, very attractive platform into which companies joining keywords through acquisition can plug themselves. Um, and it's that ability to aggregate these businesses together that really create the additional value that um, our shareholders have seen us deliver year after year through our M&A program. And all of the above really is um, increasingly um, adding barriers to entry. Uh, and of course, that's enhanced by our reputation for quality, our transparency as a publicly quoted company, our scale and our global reach. The thing that I think um, investors that have been following keywords for a, for a long time um, have come to realize is that we're really quite keen on this idea of balance. Um, and we're pleased to be able to present charts like this, which really demonstrate the balance that we've achieved in our business um, across the different service lines. Um, of course, we also have a, a, a pretty good balanced business across the geographies as well. Um, but you know that's important when we're talking about a resilient business because each of these business units has a slightly different operational profile. Um, and by spreading ourselves around the seven service lines, so we um, can iron out uh, to a large extent any sort of bumps in the road. The other thing that's um, worth mentioning on this slide is that year after year, we become more relevant to our clients. We become more partner-like in our engagements with our clients. We're increasingly integrated with our client system, delivering um, assets of various sorts directly into their game engines, um, doing co-development projects or full game development projects for our clients. So it's... Um, um, it's a business of increasing quality, I would say, year on year. Um, the revenues and the profits should be um, more robust as we continue to um, build the business in the way that we have done so far. The geographic uh, reach point is important. Um, we establish ourselves close to our clients, which still matters, <laughs> even in a world like the one we inhabit today, which is very virtual. Um, 
you know, proximity is important, proximity of culture as well. Um, but uh, we're also in locations which give us access to fantastic, passionate, talented people um, for the specific services that we require in order to provide our overall service to our clients. Um, and uh, we've been very successful in kind of landing and expanding. So where we do acquire a business in a certain geography, we've been very successful at broadening out that business to provide um, a wider range of services. And indeed, the same thing is true for organic um, openings, such as we did originally in Montreal or in Tokyo, where we now have seven service lines um, associated with those locations. Uh, we do have 8,000 people um, uh, on average who are employed during the first half of the year. Obviously, that number is increasing all the time as we continue to grow. Um, and I'm looking forward to be able to share with you the numbers for the second half when we get to that point. As we've shared with you each time, um, these numbers do change a little bit because they're based on third party studies by New Zoo and Sensor Tower. But we currently work with 23 of the top 25 game companies worldwide. Um, that's across all types of games. And we work with 10 of the top 10 mobile game companies. And there's obviously some intersection between those two. Um, so again, um, very well spread, uh, you know, keywords very much does cover um, the who's who of the video games industry in terms of our clients. So what all that translates to in terms of performance, financial performance is very um, consistent growth, year on year growth. Revenues have over the period from 2016 to 2019, for instance, we've generated 50% compound annual growth rate in our revenues. And in our adjusted PBT measure, 40% KGAR growth over that same period. So it's been a tremendously consistent growth story, both in terms of revenue and in terms of profit. And that's something that I think um, you know, we expect our, of ourselves, and it's worth just stressing. We are um, a company that is really quite disciplined in the way in which we go about things, whether that's acquisitions or whether it's growth. Um, and we're not in this for growth for growth's sake. We're interested in profitable growth. Um, so um, very pleased to have achieved uh, just that uh, over many years now. And as we broaden our business, um, so we find ourselves broadening our, our client base um, and at the same time broadening our services. So that enables us to sell more services to our clients. And if you look on um, the right hand side of the top left hand graph, at the end of the half year um, 2020, for that preceding 12 month period, um, we had 124 clients buying three or more services from us, which is nicely up on the figure of 108 for the 12 months to the end of 2019. Um, and that's on a base of about 1,000 clients. Um, our client concentration um, remains fairly limited. It's not that I would have anything um, against any client representing 10% or more of our service in particular, but as we sit here today, no one client uh, represents more than um, about 7% of our revenue. On the bottom right-hand side, um, I think the takeout for me on this slide, well, there are probably two takeouts. Um, one is the fact that the growth that I've just referred to has come across all service lines. So consistency, not only um, at the top level in terms of the, the, the overall growth for the business, but each service line has continued to grow strongly year on year. Um, and then the second takeout point is just the phenomenal growth of our game development business, which is a service that we entered only three years ago. Um, so particularly pleased to see that continuing to grow so strongly. Following on John's sort of comments on the first half of the year for these service lines of ours, um, I just wanted to give you a little flavor of what to expect through the second half service line by service line. 
So in our art services business, we are seeing um, really good demand um, across the board for our, um, for our services. Our marketing services um, business, which forms part of that, as John said before, um, has seen a slightly more mixed picture where um, some of our art services at the earlier stages of planning, campaign development, marketing strategy, um, creation, were affected a little bit as clients paused to think about what they were going to do during these new unprecedented times. But I'm pleased to say that we seem to be through most of that and um, we're looking forward to a, a strong um, finish to the year. Um, our game development business, which has uh, continued to grow incredibly strongly um, in challenged times. Um, it's not been unaffected, uh, but has done tremendously well with the growth that it has achieved. Um, and I would just only point out the fact that, of course, having had a very high um, growth rate last year in 2019, um, coming into 2020, uh, perhaps the, the first half um, um, comparators were a little bit lighter. We're now coming into H2, where the comparators are going to get a little bit stronger. Um, our audio services business uh, has got off to a very good start in the second half of the year, benefiting from access to its uh, studios. And of course, um, a certain amount of catch up work in terms of getting the audio recording for some of those AAA game releases, um, some of which uh, are certainly destined for the new console launches. So again, all being well, um, we should have a good um, second half in our audio services business. Functional QA, probably the most um, affected business by uh, COVID in the in the first half has um, seen uh, an increase uh, of activity in July and August, a significant increase in activity, I should say, um, and is benefiting uh, finally from some ease up in the recruitment constraints that it's been um, affected by. So we expect to see it scale quickly um, into these peak months uh, and um, uh, trade very well through the end of the year. Localization business, which unfortunately was held back in the in the first half of the year, has got off again to a to to, to a much improved um, uh, trading pattern in July and August. And again, we would expect that to continue to grow nicely through the rest of the half. Localization QA, um, just like uh, functional QA in terms of its setup and the same sort of impacts of unavailability of secure studios and some difficulties in terms of resourcing talent um, exacerbated further by the fact that the talent is all native speaking talent. And of course, some of those um, predominantly young um, people uh, when COVID um, came along, uh, went back to home countries and sheltered with families. Uh, that situation is easing again, um, and we expect it to have a better um, second half in 2020. Player support, which you may recall, um, we uh, had a year of consolidation in 2019, so little if any growth in 2019, looking for a good growth in 2020. Um, plans, of course, were uh, yet again by COVID, but um, that business is now growing and we have to push on strongly through um, the second half. The um, keywords m a strategy um, I think can sometimes be a little bit misunderstood and it's worth just reminding people of the real value of the m a strategy keywords is not involved in any sort of land grab we're not running around trying to buy um, any any and every company we find in our space we would we would have to do a phenomenal number of transactions if that's really what we were looking to do we're being highly selective in the businesses we acquire. We're plugging them into this global platform. We're integrating them. And then 
And this is the most important part. And then we are um, working with them to grow those businesses at a rate um, far higher than they had historically achieved before. And that graph on the top left hand corner really sort of says it all. Um, we've acquired something like 215 million euros in revenues since 2013. And on that base, plus the rather um, what looks now, now to be a fairly small base of 16 million original keywords business, we've actually laid on 116 million euros of organic growth throughout the period. On the right hand side, you can see just how selective we are with these acquisitions. We're not buying companies all of the same types. We are service line by service line, um, responding to the strategies of those service lines, filling out their expertise, filling out their geographic reach and building scale in each and every service line. On the far right side, um, the year to date picture, and I've shared this with um, investors and analysts in the past, our current focus with M&A is very much on our art and marketing businesses, I should say our marketing services businesses more so than our art business, um, and also on our game development business. Um, and that's reflected in the three acquisitions that we've made so far this year. We do maintain a very strong pipeline of acquisitions. Um, it's an interesting uh, picture. At the moment, we're finding those conversations probably easier to have than before. Um, however, uh, COVID is um, uh, placing some um, constraints on executing on those uh, transactions. There are, um, as perhaps um, demonstrated by the heavy iron uh, acquisition, the fact they have separate signing and closing, um, the, the current environment with government supports and everything else um, can sometimes uh, get in the way of doing these deals quite as quickly as we would like to do. But we are very confident um, that we'll be making further acquisitions between now and the end of the year. And then, of course, um, continue to make uh, plenty of acquisitions in 2021. And we are fortunate in having this very strong balance sheet with about 200 million um, euros of uh, firepower. So finally, um, in terms of our strategic priorities, you should, of course, as I'm sure you ha have come to expect from us, you should expect us to produce ongoing good organic growth, despite everything that we're, that's been thrown at us, and continued focus M&A. Uh, with our organic growth, um, it's continuing that process of cross-selling to our clients or um, helping our clients discover the valuable services that are available to them within the keywords platform. Um, we will be continuing to enhance our service lines where necessary with additional investments in people, in capacities, um, in facilities as, as needed, and indeed in um, helping them expand to uh, geographies which represent opportunities um, to get close to clients or talent pools. As far as our um, clients are concerned, every, everything we do really is geared around how our clients want to work. And we are constantly sort of meshing ourselves into our clients' organizations so we can become an extension of their um, internal teams. And so that ability to respond to their needs with an increased degree of specialism we're increasingly seen as the experts in the fields in which we operate and our clients are um, increasingly um, recognizing that and so our engagements with our clients are becoming of kind of um, I would say higher level integrated services and arguably higher valued services for our m a program um, as I've said, particular focus on marketing services and game development, but that's not to say that you shouldn't expect us to make acquisitions in the other areas of our businesses as well. Our pipeline um, contains uh, plenty of opportunities in services outside of marketing and game development. And um, we are continuing to not only work through that pipeline of opportunities, and we have 
discussions and um, engagements with those companies in the pipeline at various stages of development. But we are continuously um, originating new opportunities as well. So to leave you with um, what uh, the second half looks like. So we've got off to a positive start um, in H2. We all know um, what's happening with COVID around the world. I'm sure, you know, where there are going to be further challenges thrown in our path. But I'm also um, determined not to let COVID get in the way of um, uh, the keywords story, our plans, and our um, intent to provide these world-leading services to our clients around the world. Um, and so as we go into um, what is soon to become the fourth quarter of the year, we're expecting to trade um, well right the way through to the end of the year. Just bear in mind that we are going to be trading against stronger comparators. And we do have, um, certainly at the moment, a weaker US dollar that, that, than we had um, uh, six months or so ago. We are working to increase our um, uh, operating margins. And um, you should expect us to continue to drive those incremental margin performances through the rest of the second half and heading back towards our historic norms, um, probably sometime um, next year and certainly by the end of next year. Uh, we are very well positioned in a growth market and um, as the provider of scale and with diversity of these services, we expect to be able to capitalize on opportunities um, presented, um, both by the fact that we're our, you know, our clients as game developers and um, game uh, publishers are doing by and large, very well at the moment. Um, but also, um, we expect to do well from the um, ongoing trend towards outsourcing. And uh, as our clients make themselves leaner and more focused on what, what really matters to them, um, we expect to be able to provide them with more and more of the means of production. We are well funded uh, to deliver on our accretive acquisition strategy, and it really is a very accretive acquisition strategy. Um, and as I've said before, we have active engagements with many um, potential acquisition targets, and uh, we um, fully intend to uh, add and welcome into the keywords family um, plenty more companies such as those that we've already welcomed uh, in the first half of this year. Thank you. And we'll go to Sharag Vadia at HSBC. Uh, thanks for your time, guys. Um, just on your game development strategies, uh, what are your priori priorities for acquiring game development studios in terms of geography? Um, and are you looking for companies with proprietary engine expertise or third party? Could you give a bit more sort of color on that? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Shireg. Yeah, we're um, we're 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 looking to build a broad um, base uh, capability in our um, what we might refer to as work for hire game development services. So it's worth just reminding everybody that we're not um, developing our own games to publish ourselves or anything like that. We are um, providing game development as a service. So if somebody wants um, a game built, we'll happily build a game for them as long as they pay for it. Um, and uh, we provide a whole range of services within that, everything from some discrete engineering support to help our clients uh, optimize the performance of their games, for instance, through to porting of games, so moving games uh, that were um, uh, perhaps targeting a certain platform onto different platforms. Um, and we'll do some fairly large co-development uh, projects where we work alongside our clients' own game development teams, usually taking responsibility for a fairly sort of chunky area of the game and um, working hand in glove with the client to produce the um, finished product. Uh, and then we will do full game development where somebody commissions a, um, a game to be built by us. 
Um, now, in terms of the platforms, uh, we are largely, I would say, um, platform agnostic. That's not true necessarily individual um, team by individual team. But as a business, um, we're equally content to work on one of our clients' proprietary game engines, which we very frequently do. But we're also um, very competent, very competent on um, industry standard uh, game engines such as Unreal, Unity, the Cry Engine, and so on. Um, so it's it's really across the board, Shirak and. Uh, um, yes, some of our teams will be known for being experts at racing games, for instance, and some of our teams will be known for other sort of genres of games. But across the board, across what is something like uh, over a thousand people in our game development business, um, we have tremendous expertise in all uh, fields of game development. Can we go to Ken Rumpf at Jeffries? Obviously, video games is, is the core. But uh, you have mentioned in the past uh, doing more work for TV and film. And yet, I guess those industries, at least in some part, were quite badly affected in their ability to operate in the first half. Where are we at in terms of, of the kind of overlap into to film and TV? And, and particularly in the first half, was that something that took a step back uh, as they had studio issues? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ken. Good, good question. Yeah, so... Um... You know, I've certainly kept a pretty active eye on what's happening in the film and TV side of um, of the industry. And as you rightly say, they have been really quite severely impacted by COVID-19. There's been very limited um, live uh, production going on. Uh, um, and that's obviously affected the whole services side of the film and TV industry as well. And it's probably... Uh, disruption that's likely to continue um, for some time, I think, um, um, uh, give, given what's going on um, territory by territory. So I think that's going to continue to be disrupted. We, we do have um, a little bit of business in that area, as I think many of you are aware. Um, we do some subtitling, we do some dubbing, and we will occasionally bleed across into um, some of the marketing services, making trailers, um, and uh, indeed, um, uh, you know, some animated um, content here and there. Um, I do think it is a, um, a attractive area for keywords at some point. Um, a convergence of film, TV and games is continuing. And it's very interesting to see how virtual production is gaining ground in the film and television space where the use of game engine technology to make um, games is uh, really proving itself to be very flexible, very cost effective and of film ready quality. So uh, really interesting times. And um, uh, so I believe our strategy to consider entering these neighboring markets like film television, like um, the e-learning uh, space um, remain very much intact. It's really a question of timing. And um, it has been interesting to see the quite distinct difference in impact of COVID on that industry compared to games, which is kind of um, continued. Games has been able to make its content throughout COVID, whereas obviously you see film and television just had to stop, um, certainly as far as the live content side is concerned. So very interesting. Thank you for the question. And we'll go to Patrick O'Donnell from Good Body. Thanks very much. Uh, just Andrew, just based on your, your outlook, um, can you give us any sense of what the likely run rate is from the start of FY21? Um, or is it too early for that? Yeah, I think um, if, if we weren't uh, virtual, if I had said anything on that, I probably would have got a slap from from, from John Hawke. Um, I, I don't think we're ready to give gui guidance at this point, Patrick. I think the the world is still a little bit too, too uncertain. Hopefully you've got from what we've said during this presentation that we are quietly confident about the outturn for the second half. I'm certainly feeling pretty upbeat about it. And, um, you know, I think what, what causes me 
to be that way is just the fantastic um, response that we have from all uh, 8,000 plus um, keywords colleagues around the world who have just, um, you know, just just knuckled down and got on with it and not, not let the current situation get the better of us. And, um, you know, that passion, uh, that dedication to quality um, is just a um, absolutely remarkable, um, you know, it, 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 it's a remarkable quality and one for which I'm so incredibly grateful. And we'll go to Natasha Brilliant at City. Morning, everyone. Um, I've got a question on the margins. So you've talked about margin improvements as we go through next year. Can you just give us a bit more colour on what's going to be driving that? Is it revenues coming back? Is it some of the cost savings from this year that might be permanent? Just a bit more colour there. And then beyond FY21, how should we think about the margins for this business? I'll I'll, I'll pick that one up. So, um, you know, as we entered this year, you will recall we... We did invest in the business last year and our expectations were to be able to leverage um, those investments as we went through 2020. And what I mean by leverage is effectively hold fixed costs a bit more static. And obviously with higher revenue coming through on that fixed cost base, that comes through in your margins. Um, Our medium term view on that has not changed at all. Um, We remain very confident that we can get back to those historic norms. Um, I think it's fair to say that COVID-19 has just pushed that delivery out to the right a little bit. Um, You know, we do have fixed costs in our business and we were built in expectation of higher revenues than the revenues that we we delivered in, in H1. That's not to say we're not disappointed with where we've ended up given everything that's going on, but our expectation was that those would be slightly higher. Um, You know, we we are pleased that we've been able to show some margin improvement and I'd expect and hope that we would continue to demonstrate that as we go through the back half of this year. But I think our expectations for getting back to those historic levels are um, moving out to the right a bit. And as Andrew said, you know, that that probably starts to come through more in 2021 now. Um, Most of it, I think it's fair to say, is coming from um, uh, more revenue on a uh, on a fixed cost base. Um, uh, the the cost savings that we have enjoyed, I think that some of it um, we've had a natural tightening of the belt through COVID nineteen. Not least because we've been focused on delivering um, for our clients and probably less focused on hiring into other positions. Um, uh, and some of the costs that we've saved on things like travel, we all desperately hope we won't be saving that next year because, you know, we want to be able to travel to meet our customers at games, conferences, that sort of thing. So I think I think most of the margin um, development is going to be coming from the revenue leverage. Um, and as we get out of the other side of COVID, also from some of the pricing initiatives that we started the year with and we will continue to drive forward as well. And we'll now go to Will Wallace from Numis. Thanks. Um, I want to go back to the uh, game development market and and ask a question about your the conversations that you have at a high level with your with your largest clients. Uh, to what extent are they really embracing game development, uh, party game development as a as a core part of their business, or is it something that they're still dabbling with? How fast do you think that outsourcing uh, trend can? Uh, can develop and and where do you see it going over the over the long term yeah thanks will um yes i think um well it's a bit of a mixed picture to be honest across client by client so some clients are coming to outsource development um for the very first time um this is a function as you might expect has been very sort of closely held um internally by our clients it's been um you know the, the 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 knowledge of how to make a game um, has been vested within clients, uh, generally speaking, up until you know fairly recent times. Um, but some clients uh, embrace external development very structurally, so they set themselves up with the full intent, um, game title by game title, of outsourcing large chunks of the development. There are um, uh, clients that um, approach us with 
without any intent of making their own games, but securing the funding, securing the publishing um, uh, channels for their games, and then come to us uh, uh, asking us to um, bring to life their idea for um, a particular game from uh, A to Z. And I personally believe that you know, that's going to be a model that increasingly gains traction. I think um, it's no longer the case that the, um, that the secret source of a game is knowing how to build a game. Secret source lies elsewhere. It's um, having that idea, being able to bring um, characters uh, to life, be able to tell a story and somehow... Um, find that very elusive um, uh, quality of a game, which is the fun factor. Um, and from there on, obviously, being able to go on and monetize uh, the game and continue to pump content into the game to maintain the player base and so on. So um, I personally think this is an area that's going to only accelerate in terms of its trend towards outsourcing. And Pablo Ortia has asked, how should we think about the capital increase M&A deployment schedule in half two versus half one and also 2021 versus 2020? Yeah, so um, uh, obviously, you know, we did the front footed raise. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, I think we did exactly the right thing. I think our, our timing was was good. Um, we were facing very um, uncertain times, definitely didn't want to put the brake on our highly accretive M&A um, uh, program. Um, and, uh, you know, everything that I have seen, and I'm very actively involved in the whole M&A side of the business, um, has confirmed that there are some very attractive um, opportunities out there, very uh, healthy discussions going on. m and I'm afraid, is one of those things, um, you know, it takes two to tango, so it's very difficult to provide precise um, uh, uh, guidance in terms of how many deals we're likely to do and how much money we're likely to spend on m and in any particular period. But I would say we remain very confident of deploying um, that $100 million and and possibly uh, beyond um, over the next uh, 12 months or so. Thank you. And George Nano from Best Inver asks, do you see recovery back to high single digit revenue in localization and audio in half to 2020? Um, I think that would be giving uh, slightly too precise um, uh, guidance at this point. Um, we do uh, see both businesses having returned um, to growth in the period July uh, and August. And obviously, you know, we're, 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 we're tracking their performance currently as we go through September. And I would say all signs are good. Um, John, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, um, you know, uh, uh, they, they both started the, um, the first half strongly, as we've said, um, and returned to growth. Um, what they do for the balance of the year, um, you know, we've still got some uncertainty there. Our audio studios are currently open, which is really helpful, but there's no guarantee that that will continue to be the case. Um, but it's they're off to a positive start. Yeah, I think just on the audio studio side, I think um, if we do lose uh, access to um, some of those audio studios, we are in a far better place than we were at the start of COVID in that we have developed um, a very, uh, uh, what is now well proven um, home recording model in which the uh, recording talent can be joined in virtual session by our voice director and by our audio engineer to produce um, the final audio assets. It's a bit less efficient than uh, operating within a studio, but we have proven it and we have delivered plenty of content during the first half of the year um, using that model. So I think it will be slightly less disruptive um, if we do lose uh, access to those studios in the second half. Thank you. And we'll go back to Chirag Vadia from HSBC. Just a, a quick follow-up. I mean, you mentioned, uh, I guess, doing other things such as film and TV. 
Um, and again, within the game development space, do you see keywords doing more than just providing services to the games industry, but also to other uses um, from third party engines? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I, I, I do. Um, the issue that, well, first of all, we, we currently do provide um, uh, some of those services to non-game um, end-use clients. I mean, uh, in our terminology, they they are um, gamified content. So we provide some uh, uh, gamified e-learning um, type uh, experiences from time to time. We will um, get involved in providing um, um, experiences for theme parks. Uh, we have done interactive experiences and will probably continue to do it. It's nice for people to be able to, uh, um, you know, exercise their minds in slightly different directions. What we're not doing, just to be clear, is we're not um, focusing on areas outside of games for now. Um, this is all work that might find its way to our door. It looks interesting. It looks challenging. Um, and we will take on usually fairly small projects um, in those spaces. And we have a question from Richard Williamson from Edison. Richard, go ahead. Andrew John, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask again, I suppose M&A is the theme here. Um, and again, I, I wonder if you'll be able to answer or be prepared to answer my questions. Um, just in terms of the, you know, the size of acquisition you're looking at, I suppose historically or recently you've been doing quite a quite a few small deals. And if you're looking to infill around the world in you know, different service lines and different geographies, that kind of makes sense. But as you grow, uh, as you get larger, of course, you, know, um, you probably need to look at larger deals to, you know, to, to, to keep things rolling. Um, what, what, what sort of size of, you know, what's the maximum size of deal you're looking at? Are, are you constrained by that 100, 200 million or, you know, you know, could, could, could there be something transformational out there or is that just you know, it's sort of opportunistic, I suppose? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, Richard, you're, you're right. Um, but I wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, sort of uh, denigrate the value of the smaller transactions. You know, you, 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 often, often you find yourself with a choice between a larger transaction, which comes with a higher risk and possibly lower growth prospects, um, compared to a smaller acquisition with lower risk and higher growth prospect. Um, and particularly with our model, we can bring huge value to a small or a smaller um, uh, company. So um, it's an interesting it's an interesting sort of dilemma that we build into um, our thoughts on this. So there are larger acquisitions out there. Um, and we're certainly not shy of doing them. I mean, uh, we did do a fairly complex carve-out acquisition back in 2017 of a company called VMC, which, um, um, you know, we made a great success of. Um, and uh, we, we, we certainly would um, look at and are looking at larger transactions, one or two of which might fall into the category of being transformational. But... Um, you know, they, they always come with a but, right? Um, uh, these deals tend to be fairly binary by their nature. You either do them or you don't. Um, and, uh, you know, for us, we're very, very disciplined. We're not getting carried away by, you know, the idea of being able to double our revenue overnight or something like that. Um, you know, we're very interested in maintaining the quality of our business. We're very interested in being sure that we can add value to the businesses as they join the keywords um, family. And we're exceptionally interested in maintaining the tremendous culture that we've built within um, the keywords family. So um, there are a lot of there are a lot of considerations that go into making an acquisition. Um, and yes, we look at bigger acquisitions. And sometimes we choose not to pursue them. Sometimes, you know, for all you know, we, we might be continuing to pursue some of those discussions. But, um, yeah, I don't think you should expect us to be overly concerned about the size or scale of acquisitions. We're very 
very um, disciplined in our approach. So when we do something, it's usually pretty well thought out. Um, uh, we're not the sort of guys to get carried away and do some big risky deal just because it looks good on a spreadsheet. We'll go to Ken Rump from Jeffreys. Okay, quick question. Do you see more competition for acquisitions? I know Embracer bought Sabre, but they're also making their own IP, so perhaps wouldn't have fitted you. And do you feel that targets are kind of stressed at the moment in some cases, you know, suffering more than you are? Thanks. Um, Ken, it's a, it's a sort of mixed picture. Yes, there's more activity generally in the game development space, um, but not everybody's trying to do the same thing. So there are very few players trying to do what we're doing. Um, we're very much interested in the sort of work for hire space um, rather than um, companies making their own IP with the intent of publishing it and, and, and all of that. Um, the We've seen Microsoft and uh, um, companies, uh, as you've mentioned, companies like Embracer, um, still front making acquisitions, they tend to be targeting different types of businesses. They're interested in companies that have their own IP that can be exploited. Um, those same companies that acquire those businesses um, are customers of keywords. So um, um, slight, slight, slightly nuanced, but um, uh, although the market as a whole is a sort of fairly busy space, um, what we are looking for, uh, I wouldn't say it's without competition, but, um, you know, we're not bumping up against the, you know, the, the, the big giants of the industry. We'll now go to Bridie Barrett at Stiffel. I just wanted to ask if it's okay. You, you mentioned um, the expect of the increased gaming engagement seen in lockdown to, to stick. Um, and I wondered how your customers are responding to that. Um, you know, are they mainly focusing the increased sales or are you seeing them step up investment into it where keywords could also potentially benefit um, over the next couple of couple of years? And obviously I appreciate that it might be difficult to disentangle from the investment around next gen consoles and everything else at the moment. Yeah, it's a, it's a good it's a good question. Obviously, um, as you rightly say, I think um, our client base in general is has has is enjoying sort of a bumper a bumper harvest, as it were. Um, what they do with that, um, I'm not entirely sure. I I think um, well, if I was a speculating man, I would say some people would take the opportunity to. Um, maybe do um, a, a little bit of uh, housekeeping restructuring given the sort of um, air cover that the that the um, that the good times provide um, and uh, you know who knows some of that might might benefit keywords structurally speaking I think there is um, some uh, obviously um, opportunity for clients to increase the investment in new content. Personally, I think that the consumer has chomped through so much content um, uh, during these times that there will be enormous pressure on many of our clients to up the uh, content creation cadence in order to maintain um, their player bases and to keep everybody engaged and spending in their games. So I'm hoping that uh, through the next um, few years, the games industry is going to have a particularly um, uh, good period of, um, of activity. Um, uh, or, or be it who knows what's happening in the wider economy over that period of time. But again, I like to think that the games industry, um, as it has done in the past, has shown itself to be pretty resilient to general economic uh, cycles as well. So fingers crossed. Andrew, do you have any closing remarks? I'd just like to say thank you very much to everybody. Um, again, really pleased to be sharing these results with you and to be able to add a bit more colour to them. Um, and again, um, uh, should any Keywords colleagues be listening to these results presentations at some point, um, big thank you to everybody. I know it's been incredibly hard working from bedrooms, from kitchens, from wherever. Um, and please keep up the great work. Uh, it all results in us being able to have 
fantastic investors such as those that have been kind enough to join the call and analysts that um, continue to um, follow and, and write on keywords. So thank you very much.